Hello everyone and thank you for joining us in this which is the second of our 2016 series of webinars that discusses Limit State products, their features and their applications. Uh, firstly some introductions, my name is Tom Pritchard, I'm Senior Engineer at Limit State and I'll be passing you over to our speaker who is the Limit State Ring Product Manager, Professor Matthew Gilbert, uh, very shortly. Today's webinar is entitled Make More Informed Bridge Assessment Decisions with Limit State Ring and it will outline how you can use our masonry art analysis software to help you assess bridges in more detail and get a better understanding of the influence of different features. The webinar will run until approximately 1.15 UK time, so about 45 minutes, and this will include maybe 5 or 10 minutes at the end for questions. These can be posted by the question functionality that's present in the webinar interface in front of you, and we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, obviously, with a quite a short time, this is not always possible, and I do apologise if we can't get to yours during this time, but we will answer them after the webinar for you um, as well. And if this webinar does prompt any questions later on and you can and you want to get in contact with us, you can contact us via info at limitstate.com and we'll be happy to answer your questions in detail for you. So without further delay, I'll pass it over to Professor Matthew Gilbert. Thanks very much, Tom, and thanks very much for everyone for joining us today for the webinar. Okay, so in terms of uh, what we're going to cover today, um, four sections. Uh, one, um, look at how we can use Limit State Ring software to assess bridges either um, in terms of uh, quickly setting up and solving a model or in terms of exploring the influence of defects which uh, inevitably are present in, in bridges found in the field. We'll then uh, briefly cover how the software actually finds the solutions and, and, and what the, the range of applicability of the software is and also how it's been validated. We'll then apply it, the software to a highway uh, bridge example, free spun um, highway bridge example, and then wrap up with some, some conclusions. Okay, so before I get into uh, the meat of the, uh, the webinar, just to say a few words about, uh, about Limit State. It's actually a company that was uh, spun out from the university here in Sheffield uh, approaching 10 years ago. The focus of the company is providing user-friendly, fully supported software applications to engineers, utilizing uh, research methods which have been developed in the university. Um, so the, the key focus um, Certainly, of the early uh, in the earlier uh, part of the uh, um, uh, development of the company has been on developing very rapid means of analysing the ultimate or collapse state, and really our our impetus has been because if you survey the existing engineering software market, you'll see that there are two distinct styles of of software application available for collapse analysis. On the one hand, you have uh, very simple tools, um, perhaps uh, embedded in a, in a software program used in-house or a simple program, which basically automates hand calculations. Um, problem comes when you have more complex geometries or material properties and the like. It's very difficult to um, apply those um, kind of tools with confidence. The other extreme, um, there are nonlinear finite element methods, um, which are very flexible, um, general very powerful, but unfortunately still require um, significant expertise, often uh, long run times and the like. And so we felt there was a, a large gap between these two types of tool, and we've been in, intent on filling that gap with what we uh, uh, term uh, numerical rigid plastic analysis tools. And that could be for uh, geotechnical applications, so slope stability or retaining wall stability, where we're rapidly identifying the, the collapse mechanism and the associated margin of safety. It could be for masonry arch bridges, which is obviously uh, the focus of today's webinar. It could also be for the collapse analysis of reinforced concrete slabs. So that's been our focus. Um, and we have three products on the market, um, Limit State Ring, Limit State Geo, and Limit State Slab, which between them are used uh, very widely now in, in industry across the world. So 
slide that you can probably see now gives you an indication of, of some of the companies that are using the software. So large companies, Acom, Amy, Arup, Atkins and the like, and also much smaller companies and also local authorities. Okay, so um, that's a bit of a sort of introduction to limit states. Um, moving on to the, the webinar proper, um, carrying out a bridge assessment using limit state ring. Well, as um, bridge owners or consultants to bridge owners, we have typically large numbers of masonry arch bridges um, that we need to assess periodically. Um, and we also need to um, assess them if there's any planned change of use. Um, various tools available um, from um, very uh, simplified methods, such as the Mexi method, other software tools, and um, um, at, at the other end of the spectrum, um, you could, for example, apply non-unified elements. Limit state ring sits uh, in, in the kind of middle ground. It uh, uses highly efficient mathematical um, methods um, in order to identify uh, a solution. It's been validated over many years against test results. And in terms of the software itself, we've basically um, set up an interface which allows you to very quickly get an estimate of the capacity of a bridge. So for initial sift, using the default properties, you can very quickly uh, decide whether or not a bridge needs further investigation or not. If it does, then you can move to the second mode, which is to um, assign um, more realistic properties, including local vary locally varying properties and local defects. And by adding those features, you can um, get a, a much more informed bridge assessment um, out of the process. Um, Historically, there's been um, um, a, a, a kind of acceptance that uh, masonry arch bridges um, are complex structures, and uh, we've been contented as engineers to assign global condition factors and the like. However, it makes much more sense, if you can, to actually enter specific bridge features into the software to see whether or not those uh, features have a, a, a detrimental impact on uh, load carrying capacity. Um, just to uh, um, look at what other people say about um, limit state ring and the te in particular the technology that the software uses, which is uh, a rigid block method or limit analysis method. Um, it's quick and reliable for a range of bridge configurations. Um, and significant improvement from basic limit analysis formulations. And hopefully, at the end of this, uh, this webinar, you'll see uh, that for yourself. So what I mentioned was that there's two possible um, ways of using the software. The first is to use the, the new bridge wizard um, to enter in um, whatever information you have about a bridge, but bearing in mind that often isn't very much. So you use the wizard, so we enter, for example, you know, see details about the, the bridge name, location, then the geometry, partial factors, materials, and loads. I've got another example here. Um, this is the backfill material properties, where the default soil properties, where we have a unit weight of 18 and an angle of friction of 30, are likely to be conservative, and hence, in the absence of any other information, you're likely to end up with a conservative assessment of, of the bridge capacity. And as I said, if that capacity is sufficient for your needs or to meet the needs of the, the bridge owner, then there's no need to do a more in-depth um, study. On the other hand, um, if you do have um, more information and, for example, you know about uh, particular features of the bridge, um, so, for example, um, you have a bridge which is um, crossing water and there is um, an areas of uh, mortar washout, so you're missing mortar locally, then in the software you can enter those uh, uh, details directly and you can um, see what the, the ramifications are 
also directly. So that's in, in the second mode where you're actually uh, zooming in and uh, entering specific details uh, in the software. So what I'll do is I'll just give you a flavor of that by um, um, starting up the software. And initially, I'll show you um, how, to, how you can use the software in, in the first mode, in sort of the general mode, and then secondly, how we can then um, um, enter um, more localized uh, features into the software. So here we have then the, uh, the wizard. So um, I can enter various details about the, uh, the bridge, where it is, any comments, and so forth. And also, at this stage, um, I will enter details about the effective width um, that I, I want to, uh, to model. Now, there's actually two things you can do here. You can either fix the effective width, which is, is sensible, for example, for a single carriageway road of fixed, relatively narrow width, or you can use um, automatically computed bridge width using um, um, methods, for example, advocated in the uh, UK Highways Agency um, documents. So once I've done that, I then move on um, to enter details of the geometry. Um, and if I move along to um, from the abutment to the span, then I can enter details of the, the shape of the arch. Now, what I would say is the shape of the, the arch in relation to the pattern of loading governs stability. So if at all possible, it's useful to get uh, good information on, on the shape. However, um, at the preliminary stage of an assessment, that may not be available, in which case you may um, uh, need to choose one of the built-in um, shapes, so for example, segmental or um, pseudo-elliptic, um, and um, subsequently refine it um, as and when necessary. So here I'll choose um, a free-centered or pseudo-elliptic shape. I'll uh, assume that there's another span, so I click Next, and I move on to the pier. I can specify geometrical features of the pier. So for example, I could specify that the height is, is 2,000 millimeters. And then move on to the, um, um, the second span, which by default has the same uh, geometrical features as the first span. Here I'm assuming I've got a stern voussoir arch, but I could uh, instead, for example, um, uh, assume that it's a multi-ring uh, brickwork arch, in which case I could enter details of each individual ring, and those rings um, will have the potential to slide relative to each other um, to model the effect of uh, you know, weak uh, or degraded mortar. So I could add another span here, but let's suppose I've only got two spans, um, and I move on to the right abutment. Um, the possibility of, of modeling is explicitly, but I'm, I'm not going to do so at this stage. There's also a possibility of, of modeling backing above piers and abutments, but again, I'm not going to um, do so in this particular case. And the final element um, of the geometry uh, part of the, the wizard is the fill profile, where I can enter as many points as I want in order to um, reasonably well represent the, the road or rail surface. Um, I now move on to the um, um, partial factors tab, um, and the um, axle load. Uh, actually I'm actually going to assume this is a highway br bridge in UK practice. So the axle load factor that is normally entered in this case is 1.9, and the dynamic factor of 1.8. So I'm actually going to enter those values. I could instead um, keep these as unity, and then in which case I'm expecting a global factor of safety on the, um, um, the, the axle load that uh, uh, is found to be critical. I can also enter details of uh, partial factors for unit weight, um, strength, and so forth as I, as I uh, see fit. Um, move on then to uh, materials. Um, 
what I can do is I can enter different parameters for spans and for peers, or I can choose to have global values. Um, I mentioned these are generally uh, reasonably conservative, um, so unit weight of 20, compressive strength of 5. I'm aware that sometimes uh, people, if they have, you know, for example, soft um, um, locally uh, made bricks with lime mortar might go a bit below five, but in general, um, if, if you um, have reasonably substantial um, you know, bricks um, and or obviously um, um, cut stone blocks, then you're going to be in the five megapascals plus range. So I can model compressive strength. I can also model sliding either between rings if I have multi rings or between radial joints and that's something that uh, other software generally doesn't allow you to do uh, but here because we've got a general formulation um, we're not prejudging the, the mode of response we're able to to, to model arbitrary um, um, modes in the software so moving on then to the backfill um, standard geotechnical properties so unit weight, angle of friction and cohesion. And also I am asked to um, um, whether or not I want to model dispersion of live load, which, which usually I do. That's a beneficial effect as, as the axle uh, bears on, onto, a, for example, a road surface, then it becomes spread out uh, as it uh, passes through the, um, the infill uh, and then onto the arch barrel. And similarly, I'm asked whether or not I want to take account of passive pressures. Um, and again, usually I would. Um, as the arch sways into the surrounding um, soil material, then uh, passive uh, pressures will provide additional restraint. So move on then to uh, the last uh, tab in the materials section, surface fill. I can enter specific properties for uh, surfacing or for um, track if I'm dealing with a railway bridge. But I'll, I'll zoom on um, to the load section. Here, I've got a vehicle database, so I can, for example, enter in um, details of whichever vehicles I'm interested in uh, applying to the, the bridge. Here, I've got a EU double axle, which has got two 88 kilonewton axles at 1.3 meter spacings. And then I can apply that to the, to the bridge. So what I've done then is you can see very quickly using the wizard, set up a model and um, also a loading which is applied to the bridge. Um, actually, one thing I haven't done, uh, I realize I've um, in the um, um, this section, the dynamic factor, I didn't actually apply it to either axle. So that uh, 1.8 factor should be applied to one or other of the axles. And you can see actually now that uh, the, um, the pressure under one of the axles is greater than under the second axle. If I click the green button, then I can now um, see what the mode of response is. And I can also see what uh, the adequacy factor is in the output box. Now, the adequacy factor is the multiplier on the factored loading resulting from these axles. And I can also um, move the vehicle around and see how sensitive um, the solution is to the position. And what you can see is actually that although it's a multi-span bridge, in this particular case, um, I'm only getting single span failure modes. And you may also see that the, the failure mechanisms that I'm getting are probably not particularly realistic for this particular um, geometry. Pseudo-elliptic um, arches invariably have backing material um, um, around the um, um, haunches um, and hence this kind of mode uh, would be very unlikely to be uh, um, able to occur. So let's suppose that actually I, I look back in my, uh, in my, in my um, destiny notes, I found either original drawings, which I, 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 I um, could rely on, or, or intrusive investigation results, then I could um, enter D 
details of any backing that was identified. And if I go back to the um, edit bridge um, dialog, let's suppose that I had backing of 1200, then I could enter this into, oops, 12,000, that's too much, um, enter this into the software as you can see. And if you can see, we've now got a slightly different color um, um, to indicate that we have now backing material. And um, what I'm also expecting is that I'm going to have a higher adequacy factor, because the adequacy factors I've had so far have been less than 0.7, so 0.67. Um, and now I'm getting a more realistic mode of response, a multi-span mode of response, and I've got an adequacy factor of 1.18. I can move the load around and see how sensitive the, uh, the bridge is. To this load in terms of position so it looks like it's about 1.18 is the minimum I can if I want here I can add load case and I can basically run a series of vehicles across the bridge automatically um, but for now I'll just keep it it's a, it's a simple example I'll, I'll keep it in, in kind of interactive mode so we can uh, see, see uh, what the influence is of each change that I make okay so that's um, um, set up a model relatively quickly. It's then added in a feature um, which I would expect in a bridge of this particular sort. Um, if there are other features that you're aware of, let's suppose we have this bridge over um, passing over water, and let's suppose that we have um, um, mortar loss out, which mortar washout, should I say? So mortar loss. Um, of the sort that I mentioned earlier, then what I can do is I can select the um, the contacts and I can enter details of uh, of mortar loss. Let's suppose I've got mortar loss of 100 millimeters here due to washout, and and let's suppose for some reason I've got fast flowing water. It's not convenient to to point that up. The question is. Um, is that adversely affecting the bridge uh, in terms of its ability to carry live load? I can check that out and I can see what the influence is. Actually, the adequacy factor has gone down from 1.18 down to 1.09. So it has had an influence, um, albeit um, not a huge um, um, magnitude. I can also um, play around with the properties, so it's not just mortar loss I can, for example, if I had, for example, some in indication that I had a weak layer um, at the top of the uh, the pier, let's suppose I had um, a different um, uh, material with a, with a, a low coefficient of friction, it's, it's probably not particularly likely, but I can enter details and I can see how that affects the um, the app. The, the outcome. This particular case, it hasn't. If I set it a little bit lower than that, maybe it will. So it didn't actually change it. Let's try again. Okay, let's try again. It's point three. Let's try it at point two and see whether we can actually trigger a sliding mode. So sometimes it's quite fun to see. Um, to explore the parameters. Often you don't know what the values of parameters are, and it's, it's interesting to see how sensitive the bridge is to certain parameters. In this particular case, it's not particularly sensitive to coefficient of friction within a reasonable range. I've got to drop it actually to an unrealistic value of 0.2 before I get a, um, a change to the mode of response. Okay, so question is, how are we getting um, a solution how does it work well first thing to say is with regard to the um, the soil surrounding the fill we don't actually model that directly we model the anticipated effects and those effects are to disperse the load which then uh, arrives onto masonry blocks those masonry blocks then talk to each other metaphorically speaking through contacts and it's contacts where we have the the interesting modes of response. So 
hinging, crushing, sliding. And then the movement of the arch barrel is restrained by um, passive uh, um, soil pressures, which in this case are represented by uh, what we term backfill elements. And those backfill elements effectively work in one direction only. So in other words, we model passive pressures, but we, we neglect active pressures because they're generally relatively small. So these are the uh, the um, the elements of the um, the bridge that you will see after you've solved. So you see the blocks with hinges shown in red, a thrust line or thrust zone shown in blue, um, regions of the soil where backfill pressures are mobilised are shown in, in in blue as well. So backfill elements which are, are on, and backfill elements that are not on are just shown in grey. So that's the software. How does it actually find a solution? Well, of all the permissible equilibrium states, which we can represent by lines of thrust fitting within the arch geometry, we use optimization to find the one corresponding to the maximum load factor. And that also corresponds to the point at which the mechanism of collapse just forms. In terms of mathematics, um, don't worry too much about the equations. Really what we're doing is setting up equilibrium equations. So for every block, we're looking at equilibrium in the, the X, Y, and rotational sense. Acting on each block, um, we have contact forces, so shear, normal, and moment. And we also limit those contact forces um, to make sure we don't get sliding. And also, we don't get um, um, uh, um, rock. Oh, oh, well, it's a model rocking and sliding um, mode appropriately. And in terms of the way we solve the, the the problem, we basically set up and solve a linear optimization problem, which is very very quick and easy to solve. And I mentioned that this software was, has been actually uh, validated over many years with. Um, test results is actually de it was developed in the early 1990s um, in parallel with an experimental testing program so here we've got a, a bridge that's built in the laboratory in the early 90s and the software in early form was used to in order to predict the uh, behavior of, of, of this and other bridges here's a, a similar bridge from that time. Here's a, in this case, a multi-span bridge. More recently, we've um, um, been working through the University of Sheffield and University of Salford um, on trying to understand the nature of soil arch interaction. And there's a series of tests that's been going on for the last 10 years or so at the University of Salford, where we, we build and test um, within a, a sort of an oversized fish tank, these are three meter span bridges um, with backfill material and we can use digital imaging technique to see where the soil particles go and hence we can use these, uh, these tests to inform our um, numerical model that we use in the software. And similarly, uh, but at a much smaller scale, we've actually done um, tests at the University of Sheffield where we've tried to isolate each of the components of backfill which contributes to the uh, um, the load carrying capacity of the bridge. Okay, so that's um, whizzed through um, the software in terms of um, giving you an, an outline of its features and also showing you how it works. I'm now going to apply it to a, uh, a bridge in the field. Um, common um, situation, um, particularly in the UK, we have tens of thousands of relatively small, innocuous um, bridges, um, and very often um, weight restrictions will be applied to those bridges, sometimes justifiably and sometimes um, less so. And the challenge is to um, look at the bridge and um, demonstrate, if possible, that it has got um, sufficient capacity, and if not, then uh, suggest a means of um, upgrading the bridge so that it can. 
In this particular case, we, the bridge is actually on the road. It's hidden by, by lots of greenery. Um, it's actually a free span bridge, relatively short spans, which is very typical of highway bridges, um, certainly by, uh, by population. There's a huge number that are in, in the sort of two, three meter span range. This particular bridge has a central span, two and a half meter, and it's got two outer spans of about one and a half meter uh, in span. It actually has um, um, an interesting feature. Um, the outer spans actually have inverts. So uh, it's not shown here, but they actually have uh, infill material, which will prevent the um, the the piers from rotating or sliding. So we'll see shortly how we can actually achieve that in the, in the software. So in other words, the area that I um, have shown in yellow is will act as a prop and will prevent um, uh, movement um, of the uh, um, the piers uh, in, into that, that region. Um, other features, we have um, um, sloping um, road surface um, and basic geometrical features. We've actually got some backing material um, ab above each um, of these intermediate piers as well, shown in, in green. In terms of um, zooming in on the, the structure itself, it's in pretty poor condition. It's been mortared with a, a, a st strong cement mortar. A lot of that cement mortar is actually um, spalling off. It wasn't the right material to use. Uh, it's a, generally in a, in, a, in, a, in a relatively poor state. Um, this is zooming in on um, one of those intermediate piers where you can see now the invert, which is a brick invert, on the outer outer span. And what I'm going to do is just load up um, a model of the bridge, which I've uh, prepared earlier using the, um, the geometry. Uh, for simplicity, I've assumed it's um, um, single ring, but obviously I can I can I can assume look at the influence of uh, um, modeling as a multi-ring as well. I've actually modeled each span using a series of points using survey data, which is always um, um, the best approach um, in order to get uh, reasonable results. So just as time is short, I've, I've got the load simply applied at one place. And what I'm going to do is just apply um, that load and see what happens. Now, what you can see straight away is the mode of response that we get um, is not reasonable based on the, um, the makeup of the, the bridge in the field. So what I'm going to do is um, actually um, effectively st stick the, um, the blocks together. Um, in the regions shown, actually, that's probably okay. Um, so using the, the, the group select, I'm gonna select contacts, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to prevent um, hinging and sliding from occurring. And so what you can see then is um, that that, uh, um, the, the slightly colored um, contacts now um, are going to be prevented from hinging and sliding. I've probably gone too far, actually. I've probably um, um, restricted the, the base of the central um, span, but uh, you, you get the idea. So if I click Solve Now, then um, you can see that I get a quite different um, mode of response. Um, in terms of loading on this bridge, if I look at the loading that I've got, I've actually got a, a single axle, so an 11.5 ton single axle. I've got a dynamic factor on it, and if I look at the partial factors, I've got that 1.9 and 1.8, which is according to uh, UK Highways Agency Assessment Code, the, the partial factors to apply. And now, um, 
my multiplier on my factored axle load is 1.46. In other words, it's saying that this, this bridge um, is able to carry um, this, this, this load. Um, what I said earlier is I, um, I might want to investigate the, um, the potential for um, um, debonding de of the multi-ring arches. So I can set that um, the barrel type to be multi-ring. I can then specify um, that the arch barrel comprises two rings of thickness 125. And if I now solve, then you can see that um, I have a quite different mode of response. And unfortunately, I have um, a reduced um, adequacy factor. However, um, in this particular case, the backing that I applied was relatively low. Um, perhaps um, even if the, the, the structure does have ring separation, um, I can get more capacity if, if I can find more evidence of backing. And so intrusive um, investigations may show that to be the case. And so you can get a, um, an idea for how you can um, explore very easily these kind of what if scenarios. That's probably an extreme case. Um, um, and unfortunately, although it's relatively extreme in terms of increasing backing, it's still marginally now below um, one for an adequacy factor. So this is saying that this bridge can't quite carry uh, this particular loading, even with the backing, um, if the arch barrel is debonded. Okay, um, I think uh, we're coming to the uh, um, the end of the presentation. So just to wrap up, um, limit state ring um, is a rapid but powerful analysis tool, as hopefully you can see. Um, very um, easy to um, to model a whole variety of different um, modes of response including sliding, multi-ray, and so forth. Um, in terms of bridge assessment, um, two modes, quick mode using default parameters and a, and a more detailed mode using detailed knowledge of the bridge, including real-world features such as, such as defects. OK, so i um, just got a few minutes left um, to pick up um, questions. I can see that we've, uh, we've got at least one or two. Um, so the first question is, does an adequacy factor of less than one indicate a failure? The answer is it depends. If you apply um, partial factors to your load, then the adequacy factor then is a factor on a factor, and it does need to be greater than one um, in order to signify a pass. If you don't factor your um, your loads and, and materials, etc. then the adequacy factor is actually a global factor of safety. So it's like a traditional global factor of safety. You may be looking for a factor of 2, 3, 3.4, whatever it might be. Um, second um, question, is, is, is Ring capable of modeling um, skew arch bridges? Um, the answer is um, Ring is a two-dimensional program. So what it does is it models effectively a, um, a slice, two-dimensional slice of a bridge. Um, however, um, if the amount of skew is relatively um, small, so you know, 20 degrees or, or less, then um, research seems to indicate that it's justifiable to um, use a, a two-dimensional analysis anyway. In other words, the, the effective skew isn't doesn't doesn't dominate. If you have you know huge amounts of skew, 60 degrees, then you're really you're really pushing it to uh, apply a two-dimensional tool of any sort to the problem. Um, 
another question does the software have built-in models of highway and railway bridges um, the answer is yes so the highway bridges um, we have um, BD um, 2137 um, built-in vehicles um, European Union vehicles, um, construction and use vehicles. Um, also, if it doesn't have the particular vehicle that you're interested in, you can actually create your own and you can save that vehicle to your own local database so you can then use it in subsequent um, bridge assessments. Um, what is the equilibrium stroke stability metric? So we're getting into um, to details here. Um, I'm not sure how readily I'll be able to um, um, explain it in the in a short uh, webinar. But basically, it's um, it's it's um, effectively a matrix of direction cosines. There is actually in the the manual a worked example which. Um, actually has for for a free voussoir arch if i remember correctly all the different um, um, terms which will uh, help you understand uh, how the software works um, another question does the software allow you to apply settlements um, yes and no is the uh, is the answer to that um, just trying to find, find my mouse it seems to have uh, disappeared um, okay so if we go back to um, this example um, so if we um, look at the bridge front on we take the, um, the vehicle off the bridge then what the what the software is doing now is it's trying to um, increase the load in order to cause failure it can't um, another mode of mode of, uh, of use for the software is actually to um, use the support movement wizard in order to um, apply a settlement and that's very useful for trying to understand why you have for example existing cracks in um, in a bridge so it's a very um, useful um, way of understanding how the bridge has got to be in the form that it is you can also then drag the vehicle back across the bridge and see whether or not you have opening and closing and joints and the like and things which might uh, lead to a shortening of the the lifespan of the bridge i think we we, ha we do have some more questions coming but i think we're running out of time so i'm just gonna um hand back over to tom uh, we will respond to those remaining uh, questions by email uh, after the event Thanks, Matthew, and thanks everybody for listening today. Um, as Matthew said, we're now near the end of the webinar, and I do hope you found it informative. For those of you who did send in um, questions that we didn't manage to get over to, then, like Matthew said, we will answer those by email later on today or early tomorrow for you. Um, for people who aren't current users of Limit State Ring, then we'll be in touch over the next few days just to get some feedback about the webinar and find out if you have any further questions and to see whether you think the software will be useful to you. Uh, for people who are current users, um, as mentioned right at the beginning, if the webinar has prompted any questions, then please do get in touch with us via info at limitstate.com and we'll be back to you as soon as possible with answers to that. So lastly, please look out for any of the forthcoming webinars dealing with Limit State Ring and our other software products. Um, we'll be sending out event notifications via email and they will also be posted on our website at www.limitstate.com slash events. So finally, I'd like to say thank you all for listening and I do hope you can join us again for one of our future sessions. Goodbye. <laughs>